Hello everyone, it's Owen Lee again, and welcome to our fifth episode of the Shark Podcast. Today we have a PhD candidate, uh, Jaden Barden, from the University of Sunshine Coast. And he is studying shark-based depredation in Queensland um, under the supervision of Drs. Bonnie Holmes and Christine Dudgeon from the University of Sunshine Coast, Drs. Sam Williams and Jess Morgan from the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries in Queensland, and Dr. Adam Barnett, who is James Cook University and affiliated with the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Uh, welcome, Jaden. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. Hmm, it's a pleasure. You've got a lot of supervisors. I have got a lot of supervisors, yes. <laughs> uh, well, just so the audience can get to know you, um, how did you get into this line of work? Yeah, so I guess it all started um, when I was growing up, going through school. I had a bit of passion, the ocean, the animals that lived in it. And I've always loved everything to do with the ocean, whether it be boating, fishing, diving, surfing. I've always been all into that. So when I finished school, I guess it was a bit of a no-brainer. I'd um, jump in and study marine science. And I studied that through Southern Cross University and really, really enjoyed it. It was a fantastic course, got lots of, um, lots of practical skills, which I could learn throughout that. At the end of that, um, I then had an internship with the Department of Fisheries in Queensland and had the opportunity to work in the office and get to see, I guess, the management side of fisheries, which is very important and the side um, that I didn't know a lot about. And while I was in there, I was introduced to the issue of shark depredation. Now, I'd heard about depredation at that point. I'd never actually had it happen. Um, but I decided I got offered an honours program um, to go in and study depredation in southeast Queensland. So I took it and started my journey on depredation. Um, and during that time, I managed to identify a few different shark species that were depredating fish in southeast Queensland and also had the opportunity to go out on some uh, commercial and charter fishing boats. Um, and using different cameras uh, to film depredation occurring. And throughout my whole period of completing my honours, I unfortunately didn't get to witness a depredation event on camera myself, um, which was a little bit disappointing, um, but I got a, quite a few different fish heads in um, from different fishes to prove that depredation was occurring. Um, and yeah, when that research finished, uh, I then got offered the opportunity to continue and do some further studies throughout Queensland, looking at the issue in a bit more depth. Great. Um, I mean, before we go further, um, you said you didn't manage to witness a depredation event, but you also mentioned that you identified a few of the shark species responsible. So how did you do that? For sure. So uh, we used a genetic analysis approach. It's a bit like fish shark forensics. Mm -hmm. So we got fishermen to collect any fish heads that came to the boat that had been bit by sharks and put them in a big snap lock bag, freeze them, and then um, bring them back in for me to collect. And then I would drive out to the fish's place. I would pick up the fish heads. I would swap them and then run them through a DNA process um, to work out what species of shark bit the fish. Yeah, awesome. So which, which species? So throughout my honours, the, the major species uh, that we found were bull sharks. Now, we didn't get a lot of hits, um, but in southeast Queensland, that was what we got. We also got a spinner shark, a few sandbar sharks, and pig eye sharks. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's pretty, a few species. Specific. Yeah. I mean, a couple of them, actually, I think most recreational fishes wouldn't be able to tell apart, like the, the pig eye and the bull, particularly. You know, if you yeah, for sure. The so the PI and the bull sharks are incredibly difficult um, to identify. And throughout this early PhD work we've been doing, um, mm -hmm. we've been working out that some fishes are having difficulty for sure in different areas yeah. of Queensland telling them apart, right. which is quite interesting. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so do you mostly line fish or spear fish? So I like a bit of everything. Um, I started off line fishing um, a lot of, sort of local small stuff in the bay and as I got a bit older started venturing out and chasing bigger fish and mm -hmm. I definitely love the, the big game fishing side of things mm -hmm. um, but also spear fishing I do jump in the water and enjoy spear fishing as well 
uh, when the when the water's clear down the sunny coast, which those locals will know, <laughs> you know, is few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely more in those sort of northern areas of Queensland where it's a bit cleaner. Yeah, fantastic. Cool. All right. Well, I guess most of our listeners might not know this, but during the, the first year or so of a PhD, we, we do, you know, a huge investigation into, you know, the state of knowledge around our research topics. So since you're about a year in, um, to your knowledge, what is the state of scientific knowledge regarding shark-based depredation these days? Like, why does it occur? Which species are responsible? Etc. Yeah, so um, literature, I guess, around the world is is growing, and more and more and more funding is and grants are getting put into this area because the issue is becoming much more increasing around the place, and it's impacting a whole heap of different fisheries. So it doesn't matter if you're net fishing; um, the sharks are, and not only the sharks, but fish are being taken out of the nets, um, damaging equipment. Um, on long lines, the same thing's happening, um, fish are being taken off. And generally rod and reel, which is the aspect of research that I'm focusing on for my PhD, um, you know, fish are being taken off that as well. And that's very similar across commercial, charter and recreational. I guess the only difference is the level of fishing effort. So to get depredated, you've got to be able to catch a fish in the first place. So commercial fishers, for instance, who fish every day, are more likely to catch fish and therefore may experience depredation as opposed to the, the person who goes fishing, you know, once every three months, um, twice a year sort of thing. So it is important to sort of keep in mind when looking at comparisons between uh, commercial and recreational and charter fishes. But yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So have you found any, um, I guess, cues or clues regarding why? Um, shark-based depredation has become more of an issue lately? Yeah, so um, it's very much up for debate and I think it's different for sort of every area around the world. Um, and then again, within different types of fisheries. Um, but a few beliefs that we have and literature is starting to demonstrate, not a lot has been proven yet, a lot of it's only anecdotal. Um, so that's sort of what we're trying to look at a bit more with this research is making some of these anecdotal um, beliefs become a bit more facts. Um, but generally people are fishing in certain areas. So when people fish in these areas um, and they, they're catching fish, they'll generally stay there until they, they've either caught their bag limit, um, they've had enough fishing for the day and they go home, or now it's starting to be until the sharks turn up and start annihilating um, all their catches. So there's some areas um, throughout Queensland specifically that I've been to where you pull up there, you know, you drop a line and as soon as you get a hook up, you, you know, you, it's a matter of seconds before a shark's got your fish if you're not quick at pulling it up. So uh, I think it's got a lot to do with the amounts of boats at certain areas, how frequently these areas are visited. Um, and also a little bit to do with shark behavior. So sharks, we're finding can potentially be altering um, their behavior to stick around these sites um, where lots of people are fishing um, to eat and take their fish. But yeah, more research definitely needs to go into that area to mm. be able to work that out a bit more. Right, so do you think the, the sharks are more so hanging around than following the boats to the locations? So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, once again, I think it's very site specific. So. One of the locations um, that I've had the opportunity to fish at was off the Whit Sundays um, at a wreck. And, you know, it's quite a small, compact area, but, you know, it's packed with really, really nice fish, um, but it's also got sharks swimming around it. So we had the opportunity to put cameras down and you could see all these, all these sharks. It was like a shark vortex going around this wreck. Wow. Um, and as soon as your fish was hooked, you would bring it to the boat and you could see the sharks following the fish up. And if you backed off at all, if you got tired and just went, oh, you know, I need a rest, the sharks would just come up and grab the fish. So mm -hmm. if you could somehow manage to get the fish up in that time, um, you know, you could normally get it to the boat. But if you stopped to have a break, um, you know, your fish was gone. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting watching the video footage of what is actually down there happening. Because as fishermen at the top, you know, we only get 
see one side of the story. When you mm -hmm. see what's going on underneath, it is really quite a complex um, picture of what's going on. Right. So, so you reckon that the pause where the fish sort of gets its head again, that, that's usually when the sharks close in? Yeah, look, I think it very much depends on the situation. That site specifically, we were pulling fish out of about 80 metres of water. Wow. So and when you're pulling, you know, eight, 10 kilo nanoguys out of that depth of water, it's not particularly easy. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're a, a beginner fisher, for example, um, you'd be less inclined uh, to just, you know, be trying to winch the fish in mm -hmm. to get it to the boat. Yeah. And yeah, as soon as that little pause happens and the fish gets a chance to sort of turn on its side, mm -hmm and try to take off, the sharks just come up and, and smash it. Wow. But in saying that, though, um, there's definitely still, you know, the option of sharks coming up and taking the whole fish as you're winding it in. Yeah. Um, what we've seen is generally at that pause moment, though, which doesn't have to be very long at all, mm. that's mm -hmm. generally where it happens. Yeah, wow. Okay. Um, so considering how shark-based depredation affects the literal bottom lines of commercial fishers who have to go out and catch fish to make a living. How, how have they been, uh, I guess, trying to minimise shark-based depredation or avoiding it? Like, how do, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so what is mostly adopted by sort of commercial and charter industry, which are generally experiencing it worse uh, because of how I mentioned previously, mm. um, their best way of doing it is avoiding um, areas of shark depredation. So okay. when they're out fishing and they know that certain sites uh, like that wreck off the Whit Sundays will have sharks all over it. And if you're trying to take novice people out there to, you know, have a good day's fishing and catch a fish, it's best to avoid those areas. Uh, but sometimes um, there's more generalised sites which are a little bit sharky. Um, the sharks are there sometimes, they're not there others. Sometimes they're taking fish, sometimes they're not. So the fishermen will go to these areas. They'll fish until the sharks turn up. And once the sharks turn up, the fishermen will pretty much pack up and leave. Hmm. So they'll move to a different site and they'll start fishing again. And depending upon what operators you talk to, they'll just go all over the place in certain areas, you know, trying to get fish up before the sharks turn up at that site and then hit them again. Um, yeah, wow. But generally the sharks are pretty onto the sites where people are catching fish mm -hmm. because they can then depredate them, obviously, yeah. which is a lot easier than them catching a meal for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Um, well, let's move on to the next question, which is a little bit related to the stuff you were seeing during your honours, um, when mm -hmm. you said it wasn't necessarily always sharks. Who are, who are doing the depredation. So what kind of, what other animals are implicated with depredation um, in, in fisheries? Yeah, so it, it very much depends on what fishery you're looking at. Um, okay. In Queensland, sharks are definitely playing a very large role and you can tell that by the sorts of bite marks on the fish. Um, overseas, cetaceans play quite a large role. Um, and even in the sort of offshore coastal um, Longline fisheries, um, they're getting some cetacean interaction as well. Uh, but, you know, if you look at down in Tassie, their tuna that they catch are being taken by seals. Mm. So we're looking really just at the east coast of Australia and there's some really distinct groupings of, you know, depredation, which would require very different management responses yeah, to right. them. So, um, but yeah, what, in, yeah. in Queensland, the research that we've shown so far um, is it's predominantly sharks, um, but also with some camera work that we've been doing, it's also some large fish. So particularly in the sort of northern areas of the Great Barrier Reef, when you're out fishing, um, trevally are actually playing quite a large role in depredation. So we had this mm -hmm. one site we pulled up at at Lion Reef um, and we were fishing, we caught some fish, then the sharks turned up you could tell by the bite marks. Um, and then we started losing a lot of fish. And looking back on the camera footage, it was actually Trevally coming up and whoffing the whole fish down and then taking off. So without actually having cameras to know that, um, mm -hmm. you know, I personally would have said it was a shark. Um, yeah. And so would a lot of other fishes, um, I believe, based on what they've seen. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting to know you, there are other big predatory fish out there um, mm. that are very responsible as well 
as sharks. So although sharks tend to cop, you know, a lot of the rap um, and they definitely do play a big part in it. Mm. Um, yeah. It's unfortunately not quite that simple in what happens out there. So we're, we're talking like giant trevally, right? The big novels? Yeah, we're talking big fish, yeah. Yeah, big right. Fish. Jesus, what would they have to be, like 30 kilos to whop a decent-sized coral trout or something? Yeah, I'd say so. Like we brought up a 55-centimetre um, trout, um, which, you uh -huh. know, isn't huge, um, but yeah. we only just got that to the boat. So you could see the teeth marks all along the side right. of the back by the tail, yeah, where the trevally just come up and try to suck it down. Yeah, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. I've had I mean, got I some big I've had a GT try to eat a um, sort of mid-sized school mackerel before, and that it was the same thing. It was just like rake down the side. And I guess the only other depredation event I, I remember vividly was, I suspect, a giant Queensland groper. Because mm. I'd hooked a fish off the bottom, and it was fighting like a, a finger mark, which we were targeting, and then suddenly it just went whoop. Yeah. And there's just, yeah. just a dead weight that I was trying to lift <laughs> off the bottom. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you know, cle clearly in my circumstance, it was, like, very unlikely it was a shark. But if it's a big trevally or, or a big barracuda or something, it would be very hard to tell if, if you didn't get the fish back. You yeah, it's, it's very hard. So they hit it fast, and then mm. once they hit it, they just run and take off. And yeah. that's yeah. generally how you a depredation event um, as opposed to just losing a fish um, mm. but I mean I've been out there with operators um, as well who will just be winding a fish in and the mm -hmm. fish will fall off um, yep. or the hook will rip through its lip yeah um, and you know they will class that as a depredation event because that's what it seems like but on reviewing the camera footage, you know, the fish just came off the line. Yeah. So I guess it's another element um, that has to be sort of taken into this research if we're looking at it as a whole, trying to work out how many fish are taken. Yeah. You know, um, sometimes fish aren't taken, they just fall off for one yeah, reason yeah. or another. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, especially if you're so, so uh, convinced that you need to winch mm. quite a strong animal towards the boat and it's still full of energy. You, I've, I've had that happen plenty of times. I'll, I'll turn and bolt. And if your drag's mm. too tight or you're, you're holding the line too tight, hooks out. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Mm. Well, let's talk about your uh, PhD for a bit then. Um, yeah. You know, uh, what's the aim of your PhD? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you aim to shed some light on, on the whole issue? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So my PhD is focusing on... I guess four key areas. Um, one of them is a bit of an extension from my honours. So that's looking at what species of sharks are depredating fish in Queensland. Um, and that will be using genetic approaches. So we're collecting swab samples of fish uh, that have been depredated by sharks and then analysing those to work out what species of shark bit the fish. Um, so yeah, obviously to do that, we need the fish heads, um, which offers some limitation when the sharks do come up and eat the whole fish. Um, another thing we're doing is we're looking at depredation rates in Queensland, particularly in the charter line fishery. So we're going to be focusing on some key sites in Queensland, um, one being Port Douglas, uh, the Whit Sundays, hopefully, and also uh, Southern Queensland off Noosa. And we'll be going out with charter operators and attaching cameras to the lines of fishes. So these are specialised fishing cameras. They're not like GoPros. Um, they're like GoFish cams, if you're familiar mm. with those, or Spydros. And they're basically a camera that's about 10 centimetres long and it's designed to attach uh, between the main line and the leader and basically to film everything that's going on below, um, below your line where your bait mm -hmm. is. And we found those to offer us, you know, invaluable um, information on what is actually happening mm -hmm. and to not affect the fishing, particularly when you're bottom fishing. Yep. Um, so yeah, we'll be going out with charter operators, putting those on and we'll be counting, you know, how many fish get depredated, um, how many fish are caught, how many fish are released. And we'll also be looking at the behaviour associated with the sharks um, at those different sites and, how quickly it takes them to turn up, what they do once they've turned up. Um, and yeah, with the cameras um, giving us confirmation that depredation is happening, 
as opposed to the fish just falling off and mm -hmm. what species of sharks are actually causing that depredation of the whole fish as well. Yeah. So that's um, sort of the second part of my research. Uh, mm -hmm. The third part is looking at uh, the movement of shark species associated with depredation. So mm -hmm. there's um, certain sites around Queensland, like I previously mentioned, that are classed as depredation hotspots uh, by mm -hmm. the fishers, where they know they can go there they can go fishing, they can hook a fish and a shark will take it out nearly immediately. Yeah. So um, a site that is of interest to us and also Queensland Fisheries is um, Sunshine Reef off Noosa in southeast Queensland. Now, that's quite a large complex reef system. Uh, it's fished by commercial charter and recreational fishers quite frequently. And, you know, given certain times of the year, there's quite a heavy boatload on that area um, as well as sharks taking fish mm. so it offers us quite a unique opportunity to study that site and work out what's going on so at that site we plan on catching and tagging some different depredating shark species um, and then putting some acoustic receivers uh, which are like listening stations on the ocean floor mm -hmm. along with um, some sound traps which is relatively new technology mm -hmm. and that's designed to record underwater noise Right. And we'll be able to work out how many boats are fishing on the reef um, at a particular time oh. and then see if that correlates with the movements of sharks on and off the reef. Oh, cool. So, yeah, we're hoping to answer some questions such as are these sharks sitting, you know, on Noosa Reef and similar reefs all year round? Mm -hmm. uh, some sharks moving on and off the reef at certain periods, um, particularly summer, you know, when the mackerel are running mm. um, down in southeast Queensland. Are there different types of sharks to in winter when it's more of um, a snapper, rocky reef, bottom bashing yeah. uh, style fishing? Yeah, um, nice. yeah, we're hoping those will be, uh, give us a bit more information on that. And yeah. the last chapter of my PhD is looking at ways to reduce depredation. So yeah. that is going to be conducted off Port Douglas um, in Northern Queensland. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be using a range of different repellents um, on board a charter fishing boat um, to try and stop depredation or reduce depredation occurring. Um, and we'll be putting cameras on lines and we're hoping to film, you know, if these series of deterrents are actually working or um, if they yeah, have well. got their own limitations. Fantastic. Um, Do, are you at liberty to talk about what kind of deterrents you might might Yeah, find? yeah. So... Um, as many fishers have know, there are a range of different um, deterrents out there, ranging um, in effectiveness and I guess also ranging in price. Um, there's been a lot of research done in regards to the repellents um, with stopping sharks and human interactions, particularly in the water, you know, with mm. spear fishermen, with surfers, with divers, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of research specifically done um, in regards to fishing. Because when you've got a fish coming to the surface where a shark is, you know, in some ways trained to come up and catch the fish mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. at these certain sites, yep. you know, will these repellents be powerful enough to deter uh, turn, these, mm. yeah, turn these sharks mm. off, off feeding? Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, the devices we'll be testing are the Fish 01 by Ocean Guardian, uh, which has been proved um, in some previous research to be quite effective. Um, okay in regards to the field it produces. Um, so that's, that's an the, electrical one or a little That's electric. an electrical deterrent, yep. yeah. So um, it sends out electrical pulses, uh, which will hopefully provide a barrier um, between the fish and the shark for, mm. um, you know, give the fishermen a bit of a window to get the fish to the surface. Mm -hmm. So these devices uh, produce a range of about 15 metres deep and about six metres wide. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it's quite decent, um, yeah. but still has its limitations when you're fishing, you know, on board with several different operators um, fishing at once. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see the results of that. Um, and we're also going to try two devices at once. So it will give us a sort of a barrier to 30 metres down theoretically, um, mm -hmm. you know, which, which may show some pretty interesting results. Um, yeah. And shark bands fishing sinkers, that's another bit of technology we'll be trialing. Um, and they, they're based off a magnetic deterrent. 
Mm -hmm. So um, not a lot of research has been done on the sinkers themselves. Um, there's been a little bit into the shark bands. Um, so there also is some interesting potential for that. Um, and those sinkers just substitute a normal fishing sinker. Um, yep. And the theory is as the shark comes up to eat the fish, it comes into the field of the sinker before the fish and is then turned away, allowing the fishermen to get the fish to the boat. But, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. So from memory, these are like a rare earth magnet, right? These are a rare earth magnet, yes. Like what, what are the, like, I guess, marine pollutants implications if you lose the gear? So, oh. yeah, um, there's not been a lot of research done into the impact these have in the environment. So they will rust away um, if they are under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so if they were to get snagged on a piece of coral, for example, and yeah. fall to the ocean bottom, they would rust away fairly yeah. quickly right. um, without having a great deal of impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, very, um, very good question. Because of that, we're not sure if they are going to be viable um, to use onboard charter fishing vessels based mm -hmm. off the fact um, that a lot could get lost by fishes. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be very interesting to see um, to see how they all go. Um, yeah. And yeah, hopefully at the end of this, we'll, we'll be able to bring some um, conclusions together uh, mm. for the fishes on which um, device, you know, is appropriate and suitable uh, for uptake in yeah, Queensland. Yeah, right. So that's two based on creating an electrical field and one based on a magnetic field. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah so there's I mean, a few other deterrents out there that exist. Um, so there's acoustic deterrents, which were recently tested in uh, Western Australia. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also some scent and um, also sight ways you can reduce depredation occurring. Um, but yeah, for this research, we'll just be focusing on these two as um, we believe they provide some promising results from yeah. previous research undertaken in Western Australia. Yep. And I'm hoping that they'll give us, um, you know, some good options for moving forward. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, it would hopefully deter sharks from learning about a new site too, right? Like if, if people have basically had to move from their familiar fishing grounds because depredation is too much of an issue, um, having deterrence like that would, I guess, reduce the level of food-based incentive reward you know, the, yeah, the, yeah. gets the sharks to move with you, you know, in that, in that sense. In it's a way, a um, yeah, there is a bit of um, evidence to, to prove that they can learn um, mm. in regards to these fields. So um, in regards to the fishing sinkers and the, and the fish O1, one, you know, if, if there are fish being brought to the surface all the time, the sharks, you know, have been found to come in and nudge baits. Um, okay after a certain period of time. So yeah. it may be that after using these deterrents, you know, at areas for a, a period of time, um, you know, they're not Unless as effective normalized. as others. Yeah. But yeah, only research and testing uh, will find that out. And it will yeah, probably be a combined approach um, to managing this whole issue in the yeah. future. So let's have talk about that acoustic deterrent you touched on over in WA. What, what, what kind of acoustic deterrent? How does it work? Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically an auditory um, device. So it, it's sort of like an underwater speaker is my understanding in a way yeah. okay. um, that produces uh, certain types of noise right. and the sharks don't like that noise um, and, yeah, leave the fish alone. Mm. Any idea so, what kind of noise that would be? Uh, orca calls, that ah. sort of frequency. Yeah, right. In certain terms. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, in Western Australia, they, they found that using a deterrent, you know, was um, more effective than not using any deterrent at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because so our, our first guest on, um, on this podcast, he's based out of Townsville. Um, and he anecdotally mentioned the, the one time he went reef fishing and just had like a magic day. Um, in the in the last you know fifteen years or so, where where you could just bring whatever you, you hooked up to the boat, was when a pot of walkers rocked up. You know, because I guess the shark were too busy worrying about being eaten, so yeah. <laughs> they, they just stayed away. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's really good. quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, let's let's talk a little bit more about that DNA analysis, right? Like, um, yeah. so the fisherman gets the fish head, um, and they put it straight in the Ziploc bag and freeze it, and then and then get it to you, um, somehow. Do they drop it off at a tackle shop, and then someone gets it to you, or? Yeah, so um, that was predominantly for my honours research. So mm -hmm. we were collecting locally in southeast Queensland, um, pretty much as far as Tweed Heads to Rainbow Beach. So right. yeah, the fishers would bring in a depredated fish um, and I'd go up, collect it from them, swab them, and then take them um, back in for analysis. Mm -hmm. Throughout my honours, <laughs> I was started getting some really large heads. Um, and one head we got from a, a cod, was about 38 kilos. So that's quite a large head to be Whoa. transported to and from. So we worked out, you know, this approach wasn't going to work <laughs> when uh -huh. we we're surveying the whole of Queensland. Yeah. So um, we've now changed over to swabs. So yeah. we've got um, kits that we send out containing three swabs along with three vials of ethanol. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a little instructional um, document in there to tell the fishers how to swap um, right. and we've got a little uh, sticky label on the bags um, to indicate where it was depredated when it okay. was depredated what fish was depredated and yeah we send those out to the fishers all over Queensland anyone who's willing to swab anything um, while they're out fishing and then we provide them with um, envelopes and they post it back into us um, in at fisheries and we will process those and work out what shark bit the fish okay so Jaden, um you're happy for us to provide a link or an email or you know yeah for sure so um them. if you're interested in registering um we've got a website up fdrq.org uh, um and we can yeah provide the link below uh to that and i'll also provide the link to my email as well um, everything is on our website under the contact us page. Um, if you'd like to know anything more about our research specifically um, and the results that we're starting to get in, yeah, please feel free to, to visit that page and, um, and see what we're on. And yeah, we'd welcome any um, further insight from the fishers. Um, and yeah, anyone who's willing to share their experience while they're out fishing. Great, fantastic. Yeah, I, mean, I hope hopefully a bunch of our listeners um, decide to volunteer. Um, I know some saltwater fly fishing guys would would probably quite like to participate. Yeah. Yeah, and they're they're based around you. They're, they're out in southeast Queensland. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty easy. We um we provide everything to um, swap the fish, and literally the process may take thirty seconds out of your fishing day. So perfect. It makes the most of you know losing that massive big prize red emperor um, and. You know, at least at the end of the day, um, it's going towards science. And yeah, we can let you know um, if you provide your details what what shark bit your fish. Yeah. So, do they have to keep the sample cool somehow when they go? Yeah. Out? So yeah. when you we um provide a little preservative inside um, the vial, yeah. and that generally will preserve the DNA in that sample. Um, but yeah, once the swab is taken, if it can be kept on ice and then frozen until it's sent back um, to us in at fisheries, that will give us the best results um, for analysis. So we have had some issues where um, samples have been stored for an extended period of time uh, before we've received them. And unfortunately, those samples um, have failed to to work just because uh, that period of time has been too long. So yeah, yeah, generally. Um, a month is fine, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, if it's over three months to six months, it's starting to, to reach a point where we okay. may not be able to get anything useful off the Right, that so even if the sample is with Australia Post for a period of time, it shouldn't be three months. So it should yeah. be fine, even if you've got, you know, postage delays. Yeah, even even with postage delays, um, you know, as long as COVID doesn't come back and become an issue again, um, mm -hmm. it should be absolutely fine. But yeah, yeah. if if it is frozen, um, it will extend the life of that of that swab um, yeah, until right. it can be posted back. That's fantastic. Um, us cool. in fisheries. Um, before we move on, I must confess a curiosity: what species yeah. of cod had a head that was thirty eight kilos? 
So we're still trying to work that out, to be honest with you. Our right. thinking was a monster estuary cod. Um, wow. So we extracted the odoliths out of that fish um, uh -huh. and we haven't quite managed to age it yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, over coming weeks, we're hoping to age that fish and also run some genetic tissue on uh, to work out what exactly it is. But um, yeah, it, it did stump quite a few of us in a fisheries, just the wow. sheer size. I, I mean, um, I never yeah. would have expected coyotes to get that big. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, coyotes are more about one of the fish ones. Off Noosa, and it was biggest, biggest fish that ever seen. But unfortunately, they didn't get it to the boat. It was just the head. Just the head. Which yeah, would have been a big shark, though. You just imagine what size of shark, you know, bit of wow. fish that big. Was, and, was it yeah. just one clean half moon? Was it? It wasn't. It was looked like it was two. Yeah, um, okay. two bite marks predominantly, but it was cool. still, you know, still a big head. <laughs> ballsy fish, like ballsy shark that yeah. goes something that big, like that. Very much so. <laughs> I mean, I'd imagine that cod must be near a hundred kilos when it was alive. Like, oh it was yeah, so it would have been fish or turtle eater. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, well, I mean, so I guess that sort of leads a little bit onto my other question, which is. Do you often find in your DNA work that there's more than one shark species involved, like on the one instance of depredation? Yeah, so it's interesting. We've never actually been able to show that there are two sharks um, off the bite mark. Mm -hmm. So generally, when we run this analysis, we'll get results at the end. And yep. one of those, the most likely shark um, will come up. Yep. And then there'll be a next um, nearest next shark to that yep. DNA match. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is the potential um, for two different species of sharks to be to be biting and feeding on the fish. Yep. But generally, when, when we're using the cameras out there, there's a bit of a pecking order um, mm. in regards to what shark gets the fish. So you can have quite a few different species of sharks at the site yep. and even following the fish up, but only one type of shark eats the fish. Mm. So there's no real, I guess, definitive way of working that out. No. Um, but generally what we've seen so far, it seems to be the biggest shark gets a fish. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Everyone just gets out of the way of the big bull shark because he's so big. It, yeah, whatever's big. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, in Southeast Queensland, generally it's um, the bull shark uh, causing issues um, mm. in the swabs that we've gotten back so far. Yeah, wow. Okay, well, so how, how many of these little packages have you sent out already? So we've sent out about 50, uh, 50 kits out to fishers yeah. all over Queensland, um, all over the place, which has been really good. Yeah. And we've managed to have uh, 49 individual swabs returned. So nice. those of you who are good at maths, um, that's 100, 150 individual swabs that we've been sent out. So we've had about a third returned. Mm -hmm. um, we don't expect, you know, everything to be returned um mm -hmm. and we're generally finding that there are a lot of fishes hoarding uh these swabs in their freezer um mm -hmm. which is a, bit of a shame because we're not able to to get these um extracted within that sort of uh period of time so yeah, yeah moving forward would be great if we could um streamline that process a bit more yeah um but yeah off those 49 swabs that we've had returned we've been able to identify depredating sharks off 36 of them so it's about a 73.4% success rate. Yeah, nice, nice. And, and I mean, I guess that just varies on whether the shark actually left any material, exactly where the swab happened and, you know. Yeah, the it's dependent of upon so many things. It, it can be dependent upon if the fisherman, um, you know, swabbed uh, fish a certain way, um, mm -hmm. if it was stored. Sometimes it can just be a bit by chance, you know, where they swabbed the fish. Um, there wasn't much shark DNA saliva mm. on that sample. Yeah. Um, and it can, can also be that it's left too long. And what we've found as well is we're expecting that fish are responsible for some of these depredation events. Of course. So, yeah, as, um, as these fish are being analysed, they'll mm -hmm. show that they've failed when really yeah. they, they have failed a shark, um, yeah. but they were still depredated by something else. Mm -hmm. But the genetic approach that we're using um, will only work for a shark. Okay, so right. So if, if a 
Trevally depredates um, our fish, okay. for example. Genetics won't work. Yeah. Well, what about um, other elasma ranks like rays and guitar fish? Will that yeah, show up? So, no, none of those will show up. Um, okay. And then they're designed specifically for carcharinid species um, All right. because based off research, that's what's taking fish mm -hmm. um, the most, and particularly from talking with fishes. Um, yeah. We're not finding a lot of those bottom dwelling species are having much of an yeah, impact. Yeah, right. Okay. On so no, no shovel noses. Not, not in um, the fisheries that we're looking at, but yeah. um, I've got a colleague who's working with spanner crabs, for instance, mm -hmm. and they're finding, you know, that those bottom dwelling species are in interacting a lot with um, mm. those with spanner crabs caught on traps. So there is yeah. a bit of crossover application in regards yeah, to that. Okay. I can't remember who I was talking to. Um, it was a shark researcher, but he'd seen footage of a shark ray taking a fish off a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's such a such a rare animal generally. Anyway, like you just don't ever see them. But yeah, there, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was a footage of this weird block-headed shovel nose thing mouthing at a fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, it really does happen, and. When you start putting lines, uh, cameras on lines and drop them down, you see some crazy stuff. Like we've had, mm. we, we've thought we've had big fish on and it's just mm. been, you know, giant cuttlefish coming up and grabbing mm. the sink, ripping the sinkers for ages and mm -hmm. all sorts of different stuff, different interactions going on down there. So yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing when you get a window into the life that happens below your boat, you know, uh -huh. it sort of adds to the whole fishing experience because you can take it home and then relive yeah. what happens. No yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the number of stories that people have had, like, oh, this huge thing that got away, you know, it would have been a fish for a lifetime. You had no chance. It was a cuttlefish playing with your sinker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was... <laughs> the amazing how frequently it happens, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I think a lot of people would lose their pub stories. Like, I don't know that they want to know. You know? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so how many of these samples are you aiming to get? Like, so what, what's your target? Yeah, so our target is around 200 samples for Queensland. Okay. So we've started to be getting quite a few nice clusters in. Mm -hmm. So we've managed to get 14 from Noosa, um, yep. nine from the Wet Sundays, nine yep. from Port Douglas, um, seven from Morton, mm -hmm. five from Bribey, three from Rainbow Beach, uh, one from Northwest Island, and one from Stradbroke. So okay. we're starting to get a really sort of broad... Um, idea of what's happening but mm -hmm. in order to start to see species correlations we still need many more samples um from okay. all over Queensland so any fishers who are fishing in Queensland who are getting sharks um frequently even if they were to send us three swabs mm -hmm. to to collect the kit from us and send three in you know that would really yep. be helping our data set as a whole okay so listeners please volunteer Jaden needs more volunteers from all over Queensland that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I mean, we'll try our best. That, it, what you're doing is, is really, really valuable because it's such an information gap. You know, we mm. can talk about shark-based depredation. It's, it's basically like, you know, mammalian road accident. It's like, what do you do about it? It could be anything. <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. So, exactly. And I mean, the preliminary stuff we've got so far has shown that we've got um, at least 10 different species of sharks along the coast of Queensland taking fish. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, we're seeing a division with species at this stage. So wow. it's only early days. Yeah. Um, but we're seeing bull sharks taking fish in southern Queensland okay. and pig eye sharks taking fish in northern Queensland. Wow. So fishers are reporting, you know, that everything is bull sharks. Um, yeah. But because it's so difficult to tell a pig eye and a bull shark apart, yeah, um, yeah, which is complex in itself, we are mm. seeing these sort of two distinct um, groupings happening, along with other sharks, um, including the sandbar shark, which some people have heard about, dusky sharks, yeah, spinner sharks, mm. ray reef sharks, yeah, um, and yeah, even silky sharks, which a lot of people mm. haven't. Even about so yeah there are well, I mean, quite a at least sharks yeah. at least four of those people would just call a bronze whaler when they, when they saw it oh yeah you for know. sure for like, sure they, they all have that same pointy nose and sandy brown back and, and a long tail though they're, they're all 
going to get confused that way. But it's, it's interesting yeah. that the pig eye seemed more prevalent up north because when I was, when I was at the Fish and Fisheries Lab at James Cook Uni, um, I used to help the guy acoustically tag sharks a lot. And I think we rarely ever got a true bull shark. It, it was mostly pig eyes um, that we got, like anywhere from little puppy things to, to three and a half meter long arm breakers. Um, mm. And when we first started catching them, there, there was like the, the squint, you know, like, what is this? Is it, is it a pig eye or a bull? And we only, we, we had to validate what genetics was because just visually it was very difficult to tell. Yeah. Uh, For sure. Yeah. And you've got, um, you've got fishes which, you know, have been fishing all their lives, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And they've always thought that it's been um, bull sharks or bronze whales or some of these other species taking their fish. Yeah. And when they've actually sent us samples in, um, you know, we've been able to tell them, you know, it's not, bull sharks out there it's big eye sharks um yeah. you know they're taking fish and they've you know been amazed um mm. that you know they've um been a bit misguided all this time yeah and yeah interested now to know that pig eyes are taking taking their fish and mm -hmm. you know deterrence will have to be designed towards pig, pig eyes, eyes as opposed to bull sharks in those yeah. areas yeah. So yeah, all these parents could work very differently on different species and impact right. them. Do, do we have any indication of how that might be the case? You know, like species specific reactions to these turrets yet? Or is that part of your PhD is trying to validate? Uh, yeah, we'll be starting to look into that. Um, ultimately, it's still very early days in regards mm -hmm. to what sharks are taking fish. So hopefully, okay. once we have got these 200 samples, from all over the place we'll be able to start looking at proper groupings you know if there are two sort of isolations of bull sharks and pig eye sharks taking yeah. fish yeah um, and if it is that those two species are driving um you know fish being lost in queensland mm -hmm. deterrents are designed and tested on those species specifically yeah. as opposed to the a plethora of other smaller shark species which mm. are still taking fish yeah. um but aren't the ultimate culprits overall mm. yeah 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 wow well i mean even more reason for our listeners to send you more swabs you know? for sure, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> please send your swabs in <laughs> <laughs> um okay well i have to ask this this one final question because we're, we are going to put all your contact details etc in the description yeah. um and, and that is, so are you, are you, do you have an understanding of what InfoFish Shark as an app is, is meant to do and, and how it works yet? Have you had a chance to look at it? I've had a, had a bit of a look at it. And yeah, everything that is added into InfoFish on the app um, mm -hmm. will be giving us valuable information in regards to what is happening out there and how much depredation is being experienced by fishes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, any any fishers who record depredation events on the app um, will be adding to the data we collect out on the water and also from the swabs. And we'll just really put information towards that big picture um, to guide us of what is going on um, in Queensland. Fantastic. Well, it's glad to, I'm, I'm glad to know that um, you guys will find it helpful and, and useful. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, this is just a, just another way that your average recreational fisher can contribute to the, the greater knowledge that helps us resolve the issue or at least minimize it. Yeah. That's it. And recreational fishers particularly are an area where we don't get access to a lot of the time. So any information that recreational fishers um, can provide us with um, on, you know, depredation that is occurring um, is just, completely valuable because it's only platforms such as this with InfoFish that we can really get this information um, to provide us with a big picture of what's going on and ultimately to make fishing experience better for everyone and also better for the environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no one wants shark depredation to continue, really. Like, I haven't actually met anyone who, who has said it's a good thing. You know, like recreational fishers, conservationists, you know hardline animal rights people scientists basically everyone is like we just 
would like if this didn't continue, you know? So, yeah. yeah. We've worked out that it is, you know, a significant problem, um, but we've got to learn more about the problem uh, to then find ways to uh, reduce it and minimise it happening. So mm. ultimately everything we're doing now is working towards um, a better outcome, uh, yeah, for fishes and the environment in the long run. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, any, any last words you would like to put in before we call it? Oh, I'd just like to thank all the fishers who have been involved um, in the past and currently with sample collection, um, with even just ringing up and having a chat with about depredation that they've experienced. Um, everything adds to the picture of what's going on and the better communication that we have with Queensland fisheries, with fishers, with the conservationists, of, even with the scientific academic level um, is a really collaborative approach, which is going to give us the best outcomes in the future, because we want this research, as I said previously, to help um, to help everyone involved. Um, we don't want it to just be useless in a way and sort of get pushed under the carpet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Well, thank you very much for your uh, time, Jaden. I'm going to stop recording now. Cool. Thanks thank you for so listening, much. guys. <laughs>